Wow, how has the last six months been for us as an organization? Um, we have really tried our best to stay connected to the community that we support and that we're part of. Like you need to, as an example, be an ally in, in, in all of your life, not just on your Instagram. People got through the lockdown with the art. I can spend all day on Twitter arguing with people who don't like bad people or don't like gay people um, or who are transphobic. And you know, an element of me has to do that at a certain point because that's either my role as an ally or um, it's part of my role as, as, as part of people. But also, it's really important for me to be able to switch off from that and to conserve where about my energy. I'm pleased to present Kiki Bristol organizer Miles Linton's story. My pronouns are he and him. I represent Kiki Bristol. We are an organization, a community led grassroots organization in Bristol that supports, amplifies, and platforms queer, trans, and intersex people of color. We have a real focus not just on Bristol, but we also work with organizations across the country and further afield. What we're trying to do locally is ensure that people who maybe don't feel comfortable or confident or seen or represented in other spaces have somewhere events where they can feel comfortable and be included and um yeah so we do club nights and art organization link events activities where we just meet up the approach we've taken is in a time when it's not safe and required necessarily to always meet up in person particularly whilst we're in lockdown how do we connect with people who may feel marginalized in their community who may feel like their families aren't safe spaces who may just feel like they want some entertainment from um, and with people who have shared experiences safety that probably haven't spoken about as much is you know kind of safety around well-being so you know the key key events are spaces where we discuss things like well-being and loneliness and mental health and actually doing and having some of those conversations in online settings doesn't always work as well it's not always um, the best place to have some of those discussions unless you have ways to support people when they sign off those calls and if you know it's all well and good being able to discuss these things online but you know when we're in person you can you've got body language you can check in on them after and that just doesn't work in the same way online so we're just thinking really long and hard about how we can ensure what any event or activity we have online we can ensure the people involved have access to kind of well-being support once the call ends because we don't want to um, leave people at the end of it not knowing when to get support as much as social media and Instagram and platforms like that have been beneficial in the last six months in this time, they've also been a place where, you know, it's been draining for some, particularly if they're seeing their lived experience challenged um, or attacked. You know, there's a real need to disengage from some of those sources of information when you reach your max or your, you know, I, I just think it's important to negotiate how much time they're spending with these things despite them having some positives so, you know it's not going to be a surprise to anyone that bristol has had a conversation on race for some time it's a really politically engaged city place in general and you know the conversation around things like having a statue that celebrates someone whose life we don't want to celebrate um you know that that, that was a long debate there was a lot of work that went on not behind the scenes, but at a local level, to make sure the monuments in our city reflect today's values and, you know, I think a really positive outcome of the whole summer and that event in particular will be that we continue to have conversations about racism today. We continue to have conversations about the historical context, about 
a transplant local state trade, for example, and it wider context in school, then people would have, I think at, at, a, at a national and at a local level, we probably would have called into question whether we thought that statue was appropriate in the first place, certainly to keep up now. But the problem I think is, unless we are teaching people about the empire and about the colonies, um, we're just not going to get to the point where we're able to have informed discussions and opinions on the topic. And, you know, I think one of the things Bristol has achieved is it has put that discussion, it's really, it's put that discussion in particular on an international scale. That, for me, it's that simple. It's, you know, and this is, this isn't my thought. This is, you know, stuff that people have been talking about online. You know, people got through the lockdown with the arts. That was what supported people. That's what spiked their curiosity. That's what fueled their imagination. That's what helped them find escape. And that's what distracted them from their anxiety. That's what, you know, that's what they threw them. That book they read, that film they watched, that puzzle they did that exhibition that was online, that they they saw on YouTube. They, unless we treat the arts um, as something that has the power to really help us through these times, one, we're just not going to have the kind of creative sector that um, is sustainable unless we're going to support it. Um, so yeah, I, I, you know, my, my take home message, despite the fact that I also consider myself creative and, and hadn't quite realised deep into the lockdown just how much the arts were, were helping people through this time. No, I probably don't want to join a Zoom call for four hours in the evening, but if you're around for like a phone call or um, some kind of other way of connecting that, that, yeah, I guess I would just encourage people to think about how they want to connect and find ways to, to honour that rather than um, necessarily being in a thousand Zoom calls a day. I hope Zoom don't see this and transom. We're not done in terms of working out how we engage and connect the mind. And I think the more sophisticated those options get, the less you'll get people like me saying, actually, you know, after seven hours of Zoom, I don't want them more. I think just building on and responding to what we do and we don't like about technology will just move us closer to these options that when, for example, we can't be face to face, we have a, we have um, user-friendly option. I'm not sure what it would look like in the future, but I'm hoping some tech company or clever individual watching this is able to invent something that doesn't feel so kind of It's been, it's never been clear that we need a fight, despite the fact that we can't have the parade elements of it. Um, it was disheartening to see people discuss the idea of pride being cancelled because we can't have that element of it. And I, and I can totally see the importance and the significance of having that kind of visual public big gathering. But if that bit not being possible means pride as the whole thing, it's cancelled. I think we've missed we've missed the origin of pride. You know, the, the need to reflect on who is still vulnerable, who still isn't seen, who still isn't supported. You know, there's there's so much that goes into pride all year round, quite frankly, not just in one month of the year. So for me, yeah, 2025 is all about um, recognizing what pride means at its core, without all of the the things that maybe are sometimes seen as the most similar to sort of more of an emphasis on how individuals choose to express themselves is what is, yeah, is what I would encourage you rather than you know one right way of being queer or one right way of being black or one right way of being queer or black. I think you know do 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 what works for you and you know anyone who isn't cool with that is probably not someone to be around. Nine times out of ten, if you ask me whether I would want to spend that level of energy checking in on a friend or having an extra hour in bed or debating with someone who doesn't see me and doesn't value my life experience, generally speaking, I'm going to opt for one of the first options because I just 
think we have to guard our time and resource a lot better. And uh, I can spend all day on Twitter arguing with people who don't like black people or don't like gay people um, or who are transphobic. And you know, an element of me has to do that at a certain point because that's either my role as an ally or um, it's part of my role as, as, as part of the But also, it's really important for me to be able to switch off from that and to conserve where I put my energy and where I resource. Like QD and like other organizations across the country, having them have a remit to do some of that work and having anyone who's interested able to support and join them to do their work, I think is how we do it. But I don't know that we need to task everyone with necessarily undertaking that work, unless it's something that they're particularly passionate about, in which case join them with a group who can support you in that endeavor to break down some of those walls and connect communities, because it does take time, it does take effort and resource, and it is really emotionally and intellectually taxing. So um, I do think we need to do it. I don't think everyone needs to do it. I think if we're going to do it, we should do it collectively. And I think we should do it from a place of education. So from a place of sharing knowledge and lived experience, rather than a place of lecturing people about what they don't know, you know, don't understand or, yeah. But it's work. I think we have to recognize that as work, because it is not easy, particularly when it's, for some people, an intellectual discussion is something they might be interested in for other people that's their lived experience. Because, you know, when I, if I have a discussion with someone about racism, and for them it's an abstract thing that they can read in a book, but have never experienced. And for me, it's something that I've got that has impacted me in my life throughout time. And so much that's happened in 2020 that it, I just can't see so much societal shifting and changing, not having some lasting effect. And I think, you know, I think we're going to have, I hope we're going to have more open um, conversations about race and racism. I think we're hopefully going to have more conversations about the sections of our society that aren't just vulnerable, but have faced additional disadvantage during the lockdown. Um, and I hope we are going to have a real, like a, a much better public and national discussion about how we ensure the faith industries are supported and public because um, they're just so essential to how we navigate, particularly the times. Um, so yeah, that, yeah, that's why.